Thanks, Ron. I want to um, talk about uh, childhood poverty and its consequences both uh, for children and for children's eventual uh, life chances as adults. And I want to tie the policy aspects of this to the uh, opening sessions on SES. Um, I think when most of us think of SES, we think of it as uh, an unchanging condition across children's childhoods. Uh, and uh, we think of interventions in response to the SES gradient to be uh, not changing SES, not thinking of interventions that might actually change family SES, but rather the kinds of programs that uh, we just heard about, the parenting programs, the early childhood education programs, uh, health programs, and so forth. So I want to try to get people to be thinking about SES in a much more dynamic framework than I think most people do. Um, and in thinking about policy, there is no policy to change SES. There are policies to change components of SES. We have income support policies that change that component of SES. We have training programs, schooling programs that change that component of SES. Uh, we have job training programs that, uh, that change the occupational component of SES. If you look uh, across childhood, uh, what you see in these components is that uh, each of them are fairly dynamic. Uh, income is changing a lot from one year to the next. Uh, this is something that uh, we've known for 40 years. Uh, if you categorize p kids according to uh, their income between their prenatal year and age two, and look at kids who are very low income, under $15,000 a year, only about half uh, are under $15,000 between ages three and five, uh, only half between ages uh, six and 15. Uh, we know that uh, in the United States at least that education levels, especially among women with relatively low education levels, change quite a bit uh, across their, uh, their 30s. So SES uh, should really be thought about uh, not as a monolithic concept, but as components. And in thinking about policy, we should certainly put on the table the kind of uh, intervention, um, uh, interventions that we've just heard about. But at the same time, I would argue we want to put on the table uh, SES interventions, in particular income interventions. So that's going to be the uh, point of my talk today. Every year, the Census Bureau goes out and counts the number of uh, poor children there are in the United States. Poverty is defined in the United States uh, as uh, having a family income uh, for a family of three that's under $17,000 a year. Uh, for a family of four, it's about $22,000. So when the Census Bureau went out uh, last spring and counted the number of poor in 2010, uh, they found that for children under age six in the United States, 25%, uh, 5.3 million kids, lived in families with incomes that were as low uh, as, uh, as I just mentioned, below $17,000 for a family of three, below $22,000 for a family of four. Huge number. Um, it's gone up, obviously, with the recessions. The shaded areas here are the uh, recessions. Um, and my uh, interest is in um, policies that might be adopted to <laughs> Uh, change the economic component of SES, and then to ask what impact that might have. Um, here's another uh, slide from the, the census data. If you look to see uh, to what extent families are brought out of poverty by different programs, one of the most prominent for working families is the Earned Income Tax Credit, uh, which we spend about $45 billion a year on. It pays up to $5,100 per year to working families, uh, depending on their family size and depending on their, uh, their earned income. The United States has never bought into a child allowance uh, kind of scheme with unconditioned payments to families, uh, but rather has geared its uh, income support policies toward uh, incentivizing work. Uh, and it's put quite a bit of money into this. So the $45 billion that have gone into the EITC uh, are sufficient, if you look at the, the income distribution figures, to bring about uh, a million children out of poverty. Right? So it's a, a, a remarkable SES intervention. Uh, and the question is, so what? Can we really expect 
uh, uh, income intervention uh, that's altering SES to have uh, benefits for kids both in the short run uh, and in the long run. There have been a number of interesting studies uh, looking at short run impacts of, uh, of changes in income. Um, here are a couple that are geared to this earned income tax credit program that I mentioned. Uh, the earned income tax credit program began uh, with the Reagan administration on a very small scale. Uh, under Clinton, uh, with welfare reform, it expanded very dramatically and became much more generous. So we have the possibility in the mid-1990s uh, of comparing children and families before and after the expansion of the Earned Income Tax Credit. Uh, it turns out the, the, the expansion was somewhat differential depending on family size, so you can do this kind of natural experiment of comparing changes in test scores for kids and changes in uh, health of mothers uh, that might be differential for families with two or more kids versus one child for moms who are likely to be uh, eligible for the EITC. So it's not a, a, a pure experimental design, but it's a nice quasi-experimental design. And one paper uh, looks at children's achievement, and what you find is that this expansion of several thousand dollars uh, in the 1990s uh, was associated with about a fifth of a standard deviation uh, increase in uh, test scores, both math and reading scores. Uh, there was a separate study uh, that looked at maternal stress uh, by linking uh, information from the health interview surveys before and after the expansion, again differential for, depending on family size, for women likely to be eligible for the ITC. And what they found was a number of uh, indicators of reduction in stress because of this increased uh, generosity of the EITC. Uh, they found this both in biomarkers, C-reactive protein levels being above threshold declined, uh, and self-reports of uh, a mental health, uh, a bad mental health days declined as well. So it's interesting kind of quasi-experimental evidence that there might be short-run uh, impacts uh, both affecting kids and affecting uh, mothers in ways that might play out through parenting to, uh, to benefit kids as well. But what about longer run effects? Uh, and here we can uh, talk um, about specificity of poverty in early childhood and link it with a nice uh, data set to um, how kids turn out when they become adults. So the data here are coming from uh, a longitudinal study, uh, panel study of income dynamics, uh, which has followed a nationally representative sample of kids um, from the late 60s uh, all the way to the present day. So you've got uh, several birth cohorts of kids who are observed, uh, whose parents are observed in the prenatal year, the birth year, every single year of childhood. Uh, and those kids grow up, leave home, and they are interviewed when they're uh, in adulthood. And I'm focusing here on uh, interviews taken when those kids are adults uh, between ages of 30 and 41. Here's an analysis that was uh, published last year using these data. And the uh, uh, analysis here took uh, the log of annual earnings between ages 30 and 41 or uh, average work hours, annual work hours, uh, between ages 30 and 41, and tried to assess to what extent uh, very early life income seemed to have the strongest association with these adult measures of productivity. So the analysis uh, had these outcomes, earnings or work hours, as dependent variables. Uh, there were a lot of control variables, education level, family structure, test score of the parents, and so forth. Um, but also, there were measures, uh, very high quality measures, of average income between the prenatal year and age two, average income between ages three and five, and average income between ages six and 15. All right, so we're trying to look at the association between income and childhood, um, in particular early childhood, controlling for income later in childhood as well as these demographic conditions. So again, it's not an experiment, but it's a very heavily controlled test to try to see whether the associations with early income and these adult outcomes are particularly uh, important. Uh, and they turned out to be. So if you look at the first set of bars, uh, these are the effect sizes 
that were estimated uh, for, uh, we scaled it here, a $5,000 uh, per year increase. So every $5,000 increase for low-income families is associated with about an 8%, this is between the prenatal year and age two, uh, an 8% increase in, uh, in, in earnings between ages 30 and 40. Uh, so if you think about that over the four years of prenatal year, birth year, age one, age two, uh, that's about a 30% increase in earnings uh, during that period. Uh, and in contrast to the statistically significant effect of early income, uh, there was an insignificant association with income later in, uh, in childhood, either ages three to five or six to 15. If you try to break up six to 15 further, there's no action at all. Now, that's a very important result. If you think about, we've talked about health as an outcome, but if you're talking to someone who happens to be from Arizona, uh, <laughs> and try to make a connection to what's important for the average person, uh, knowing what affects uh, adult productivity is absolutely vital because having a productive labor force 20 years from now or 30 years from now um, is going to contribute to the growth rate of the economy and uh, even small differences in the uh, growth rate of the economy are going to go a long way in solving the deficit problems and, uh, and it goes on and on. So there are uh, very substantial benefits if you can link uh, childhood conditions to these adult productivity measures. Um, it turns out if the data aren't good at looking at childhood pathways, but you can try to figure out why these earnings uh, effects exist. Uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, a behavior pathway. If you look at early income, uh, potentially linking to uh, crime, arrests, incarceration, uh, out of wedlock childbearing, there's no unique uh, role for early childhood income for those kind of uh, demographic events. Uh, even if you look at schooling, schooling is um, completed schooling uh, is, it has a significant association, but only up, up to about age 20 or so. There's so much additional schooling that low-income uh, mothers get in the 30s that's unrelated to early income. That, that doesn't seem to be the pathway. The big thing is work hours, variation in work hours. It's people's ability to sustain full-time work. It shows up both for men and women. And that gets us into uh, the, the new part of the analysis that, uh, that we've just completed, and that is health, right? Can you think about uh, health pathways that might be affected by economic deprivation in very early childhood that would in turn impair people's ability to sustain full-time work and produce lower earnings? And in the paper, we concentrate on the, uh, the immune, immune pathways uh, people have talked about that already. Uh, again, this isn't a health study, but there are measures um, between ages 30 and 41, again, of uh, self-reports of arthritis and self-reports of hypertension, both uh, related to uh, immune function pathways. If you just look at the, uh, the prevalence, what fraction of uh, interviews that people were uh, providing between ages 30 and 41, um, had reports of uh, arthritis. Uh, it's about 10% uh, among kids whose very early income was um, low, defined here as under $25,000 a year on average. Uh, and in contrast, higher income um, kids ended up with uh, rates of uh, arthritis are about half as large. Hypertension, again, about a two to one ratio, uh, but here it's almost 20% of kids whose family income was very low in early childhood uh, end up um, reporting uh, hypertension. So that's the, the prevalence. What about the, the impacts? To what extent do, can we really associate very early income with, uh, with these adult conditions? And here we do the same kind of analysis as before. Uh, we have, uh, instead of earnings and work hours, we have uh, the fraction of time that people were reporting arthritis between ages 30 and 41, the fraction of time people were reporting hypertension, uh, and you get the same kind of pattern, that it's income in the prenatal birth year, first year, and second year of life that has statistically significant associations with uh, these conditions, and incomes later in childhood uh, don't. So it seems that there may indeed be a health pathway that's linking to, uh, to earnings. Um, 
and uh, if you try to account for the, the earnings effect, you get about 20, 25% of that earnings effect that you can account for with these, uh, with these conditions. So in summary, um, we've seen in this work and in the past work that uh, this uh, early income period seems to be particularly important for uh, important outcomes in adulthood, earnings, work hours, and, uh, and now these immune-mediated diseases. Uh, and I think when we think about interventions, we can think about parenting interventions, we can think about early childhood education interventions, but we should put uh, economic and SES-related interventions on the table at the same time. Thank you.